What an epic week in Washington, D.C. In the early morning hours of January 7th, the House of Representatives elected their new speaker, Kevin McCarthy of California. It went to 15 rounds, but they finally got the job done. And the U.S., at least in theory, now has a functioning House of Representatives. So what did we learn from this process? Well, here are my three takeaways for the week of the House majority impasse. Number one, members of the House from both parties displayed an absolute fear of any kind of open debate and discussion. It was their opinion that debate and discussion slows down the work of the quote-unquote people's house. Of course, this comes from the same body that failed to pass a budget during last year's session. So you really have to wonder what quote-unquote work it is that they're referring to. Second, we saw an incredible intolerance for any kind of disagreement or dissent. We had members of the House who went on record saying that anyone who disagreed with their choice for Speaker of the House was a quote-unquote terrorist. And third, we had one party completely ignore the majority of their constituents when they chose their candidate for Speaker of the House. So in a week's time, the entire House showed their hostility towards debate and discussion, declared anyone who disagrees with them to be enemies of the state, and time and time again, willfully ignored the desires of their constituents. And when you add all this together, it really becomes obvious that the people up there in D.C., in the House, they don't represent you and me. Now, some people were disillusioned by this. I personally found it quite liberating because truth is always liberating. But it does beg the question, if they don't represent us, who do these people actually represent? In other words, who represents whom? Well, to answer this question, it's best to rethink the term representative. You know, we hear that word a lot in our society. And the best way to think about it is kind of like a customer service representative at Walmart or Verizon Wireless or Ford Motor Company. In other words, the representatives there certainly talk to the public. They deal with the public. They interact and interface with the common person on the street. But at the end of the day, they don't represent the people, the customers. At the end of the day, these representatives represent their companies or corporations. And the same can be said for the folks of D.C. You see, they don't represent their voters, their constituents. They don't even represent the people as a whole. The folks in D.C. represent D.C. No, my friends, the sad reality is that the only time these individuals need the voters, need their constituency, is every two, four, or six years when they need to be reelected to office. And aside from that, what you have to say has very little bearing, if any, on the business-as-usual attitude of Washington, D.C. So when people ask me, well, what do we do about all this? What should we do? Well, one of the first things we have to realize is that the people that we are electing and sending up there to Washington, they represent D.C. to you they don't represent you in D.C. And a lot of people get discouraged when they see that truth. I do not, though, because truth is illuminating. Truth is a great light. It sheds light on any situation. And the truth is this. The people up there don't care about what you say or you think unless what you say or think threatens the status quo. So ultimately, party affiliation and these prepackaged ideologies, all that's an illusion. The only thing that matters to the folks up there is maintaining that status quo. And logically, the only thing that will get their attention is a change in the status quo. This is Kevin in Texas saying God bless each and every one of you. I'll talk to you later.